Um, it's now my pleasure to turn a little bit sideways here to Maxime Schreier. Maxime was born in Moscow in 1967 to a Jewish Russian family. With his parents, he spent almost nine years as a refusenik and immigrated to the United States in 1987. He studied at Moscow University, Brown, Rutgers, and received his PhD at Yale in 1995. He's currently professor of Russian, English, and Jewish studies at Boston College, where he co-founded the Jewish Studies Program. He also directs the project on Russian and Eurasian Jewry at Harvard Davis Center. Schreier's published more than 15 books of nonfiction, biography, criticism, fiction, translations, and poetry, and has been the recipient of a number of fellowships, including those from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Rockefeller Foundation, and others. He won a 2007 National Jewish Book Award for his two-volume Anthology of Jewish-Russian Literature, and in 2012, Schreier received a Guggenheim Fellowship for his work on poets as witnesses to the Shoah. Tonight, Schreier will read from of Politics and Pandemics, Songs of a Russian Immigrant, and I invite you to welcome him now. Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to say first that it's a great pleasure to read alongside Margaret Singer. I've been a longtime reader and admirer of her work. And it's finally wonderful to meet you, Margo. I also want to thank uh, Monica and Holly. And uh, I've said this before to Holly. Holly, I'm going to say it again, and I would like you to write this down, because I don't think you took seriously what I said before. <laughs> Holly's introductions are really beautiful. And I told her once that if she just kept putting them into a folder, it will make for a wonderful book on Jewish American literature. So, Holly, I will top it with a promise that if you do that, I will publish it in my book series. So, how's that? <laughs> and uh, I also want to tell you, I'm really happy because both my daughters are here. Uh, one is selling books in the back, and the other is here, uh, embarrassing herself, uh, taping this. Uh, when your children are in the audience, your writer's existence has been justified, right? Uh, and uh, I feel very, very happy. And uh, this little book surprised me, and I just want to tell you a little bit about how the book uh, began. In, it began in the late fall of 2019 when uh, I started responding to this great despair I felt at the time, initially despair over uh, then the onslaught of Trumpism, but also what then felt like a very lackluster performance of the Democratic presidential candidates. It began as satires in the English language, and as uh, some of you may know, I uh, had been writing prose in English for many years, but my poetry had largely remained in the Russian language, my native language. And then these uh, initially political satires started pouring out of me. And then when COVID, the first wave of COVID began, and when life retreated, I quickly forgot about politics and really felt that it's the subject of the pandemic that I wanted to reflect on. And the bulk of the book, which deals with uh, sort of the intersection of the immigrant, Soviet, and pandemic experiences was written in the course of several months in our Cape Dacha in South Chatham, where the whole family escaped and we stayed there for a number of months. It was actually one of the happiest times in my life. And I wrote steadily, and uh, uh, the book came out uh, in the fall of the first pandemic year. And uh, so I'm going to just read a few poems. Uh, first, uh, a longish piece, which is a prologue, but it was one of the last that I wrote, and which explains uh, how, as uh, a Jew, as an ex-Soviet immigrant, uh, I felt about this whole, uh, this whole experience that we um, all lived through, um, and it's called Prologue. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that in doing this, I also invented a certain voice, which I call a Russian immigrant. And I've been writing in that particular voice. It is not at all the voice of my fiction. Uh, 
Vicky, I hope you will agree with that. Uh, and so it's called Prologue, A Russian Immigrant Meets His Double. It's written in Terza Rima, and one of the things you will hear is that I'm deliberately conversing with uh, a number of uh, Russian poets. Well, these days one should be, one has become very sensitive to how one speaks about anything Russian. Uh, the Russian language poets, some of them were actually born in Odessa and probably uh, considered Ukrainian by today's standards, but uh, they wrote in the Russian language and some of them were Jews and also some American poets who were important in my formation. In any case, um, prologue, a Russian immigrant meets his double. One. We used to live on Beacon Street in Brookline. The year of the election was underway and all the different contenders looked like caricatures of virtue and dismay. And yet I chose the ones I could contend with as long as they succeeded, come what may, in beating the Trump and rescuing our tender democracy from a looming right-wing threat. I knew our freedom needed a defender. I didn't know how this theatrical election could be so dull. And when I felt fed up with all the rest, I usually took our silver miniature poodle for walks in a secluded old park with stroll around the circle and I would doodle with words and rhymes and later I would park them on my desktop as though silly verses could offer solace and also hit the mark of truthfulness and justice universal or simply paint a picture of spring eternal too. The vernal season wasn't far ahead. The body shunned the chill and craved the sunny, longerous days, the honey of New England. On my long walks, I would observe a skinny, bespectacled fellow with a Newfoundland, old and piebald. When the weather wasn't rainy, they occupied a bench near the sandbox where the children built their castles. The owner read the dog lay on the ground for Weeks, I walked my poodle round the circle without ever speaking to the men who seemed withdrawn or even antisocial, who owned a dog too weak to join the clan of other dogs careening or escaping from their owners who knew not where they ran. And yet I wondered, what if this is fated? What if he's also a Russian immigrant, my own double conjured up created to help me shape these lines into a rant against tyranny, indifference, injustice, against cruelty, contempt, intolerance. Thus I envisaged. When he came from Russia, he brought with him a puppy, now 14. He's outlived his age and broken records, an immigrant dog the world has never seen. I thought the owner lived in Moscow or Saratov, then immigrated at the age of 37 and settled in one of Boston's near suburbs where streets and parks resound with Russian verbs. Three. Meanwhile, the Ides of March augured disaster. The crown prince of death had crossed the Styx and from the underworld returned to spread death faster than doctors could invent a medical fix. The Trump was useless, Congress dragged its feet, and I forgot about politics. The living life retreated. The quarantine ruled over Boston. Zoom became our window into the world. Imagine my esteem for frozen spinach and for canned tomato. We homeschooled the kids. My wife saved lives. I taught remotely at night. I tried to veto the hours of Netflix. Then I realized that in pandemics, arguments like mine rang hollow, appeared oversized, especially to a keening teenage mind. I tinkered with some writing, nothing lofty. I watched old Soviet movies to unwind. I read my favorite poets, Zabalotsky, Akhmatova, Silvinsky, Pasternak. I went outside when the New England sky bled colors of sunset. I headed for the park where the dog owners maintained their social distance, whereas the dogs refused to stay apart. My immigrant double 
kept his old place beside the sandbox. Now cordoned off, he set a pad in hand. The Newfoundland was dozing at his feet. Sure enough, his memory was filled with greener pastures. The immigrant dog was tired. Tired of life? I wondered as my restless silver poodle was pulling at her leash and urging me to make my move to seek out my double. A gust of wind went through a willow tree. I strained my mask and slowly approached. Please note the haunting symmetry. Two immigrants, two dogs. I finally broached the subject indirectly with a nod. Excuse me. And I don't mean to encroach upon your privacy. Don't you find it odd that we've been bumping into one another without ever sharing a word of conversation? I was wondering where in Russia you come from. My good double looked askance at me, then turned his gaze in the direction of sunset and replied, his Slavic accent not very strong yet tangible, my old home has been renamed or unrenamed to be exact. St. Petersburg, I guessed. St. Isaac's Dome, yes, he confirmed, and countless other beauties. I love your dog, I interjected. He's so calm. He's dying, said my Russian immigrant double. I'm so sorry. No need. Now death's at everyone's door. I guess you're right. I heard you dabble in poesy. I chose to ignore his tone. I was interested in the substance of what he meant. Yes, more or less, now more in English than in Russian. Ha! Another instance of trying to outdo Nabokov at his game, my double asked. No, a survival instinct. My audience is here. I came back. Your audience? My double turned his statement into a question. I was losing track of our coded exchange. A stalemate? I said, preparing to leave the park. Wait, please Disregard my sarcasm, the Russian immigrant said. My mood is dark. My mother is 85. My dog is dying. I'm lonely. I sit in this old park and think about the virus. Yes, times are trying. We all do what we can. I said, no, wait. My double asked his own voice, defying the rules of distancing. Can you create a living record? I'm not sure what you mean. Can you describe this? This? You mean the taste of spring on our lips? The April wind? No! The pandemic! My double spoke with passion. The way we immigrants endure every kind of destiny's tricks. But this, this is too sudden. He turned his gaze downward where in the sand the local children used to play. This is too sodden with death. Forgive the unintended pun. I think I can, been writing in a trance don't stop, intoned my Russian immigrant. A mask slipped down and revealed his countenance, a feverish smile dancing on his lips. So that's, uh, that's uh, the longer piece. Uh, and if you don't mind, I'll read a few shorter ones. Uh, perhaps um, just sort of to follow through one thread of this. Uh, um, what... What started happening is I reflected on the pandemic and that in turn took me back to some aspects of my Soviet childhood and youth that I honestly hadn't revisited in a long time. And uh, I'll show you a, a trajectory of how I came to it. Uh, this poem is not about the Soviet past, but the next one will be. This is called Go Clamming and Recite Russian Poetry. And it's uh, for my daughters, Mira and Tatiana. At low tide, I bring my daughters where the ocean meets the pond. We call this area three waters. Beyond it lies Nantucket Sound. We join a troop of local pickers digging the yellow sandbar. In our party-colored slickers, we look like tourists, though we are Bostonians. The virus, dreadful, has sent us running to the Cape. In Chatham, we've taken refuge. This dacha is our last escape. How long will last, God only knows. The clams lie buried in the mud. The sun is bright, the panic grows. God grant that we don't go 
matter. And um, some of you who are readers of Russian poetry certainly heard a famous line from Pushkin, which uh, I deliberately placed just to work through that trajectory. Uh, however, the next poem I read uh, really deals directly with uh, um, the um, experience uh, which, incidentally, the war in Ukraine, I think, has forced a lot of ex-Soviets, uh, Jews and not Jews, to uh, return to. This poem is called Sentimental Education. And uh, one thing I should tell you about it is that the uh, patronymics of uh, the school teachers that I name in this poem are deliberately a play on the patronymics of famous Russian uh, writers and uh, one very famous English language writer uh, and also the names of uh, Soviet leaders, Stalin included. Sentimental education. Soviet women past their prime in aubergine turtlenecks washed to sheen, Vera Josephovna, Pearl Baum, Lyubov Leonidovna, Bernstein, public detractors of Stalin, secret admirers of Pasternak, keepers of old family cooking style, cloves and garlic, celery and parsnips, Dear children, you must love the classics they preached in voices laced with pain as our masters shot down a South Korean liner west of Sakhalin in the Sea of Japan. The English teacher, she's no dummy, spoke one classmate. Jews are usually smart. I stared out the window. Fucking Russian teacher, spoke another classmate, this sniveling Jew bitch. I smashed the window. All the world's a stage and we are merely players, repeated Vera Vilyamovna Perlstein. Children, drop by drop, squeeze out the slave, repeated Lyubov Antonovna Birnbaum. Outside the window, the warm-hearted playboy Brezhnev was dying. After him, the bloodthirsty spymaster Andropov was dying. After him, the timid party secretary Chernyanka was dying. Then Gorbachev fought for his spot under the sun of the dying. We read Lady with Labdog. We memorized Shakespeare's sonnets. We learned to love and betray one another. A whole lifetime wouldn't be enough to shape the memories of this rancorous theater. Uh, and perhaps uh, a couple of more, if I may. Uh, one um, which has to do with Crimea, which, uh, as you know, 250 years ago was neither Russian nor Ukrainian, and then it was annexed by the Russian Empire as part of uh, the territorial gains on the coast of the Black Sea, and then Khrushchev had the great wisdom to give it to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, and it was Crimea, which worked well for me because I got to travel there several times to do research on the show in Crimea when it was still Ukraine. When it stopped being Ukraine, I stopped traveling there. Uh, and uh, um, in the 1970s, there was an epidemic of cholera in uh, the south of the Soviet Union, particularly around the delta of the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea coast of Russia and Ukraine. My father, who uh, is a writer and a medical doctor, was in a group, a small group of uh, epidemiologists who was sent to Yalta basically to work out a plan of containing uh, the epidemic. The irony of this is that that same summer, my parents and I were vacationing in Crimea and uh, we had to evacuate and then my father went back uh, to work. So the poem is called Cholera in Crimea. I actually pretty much gave it away, but uh, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> um, Cholera in Crimea. I don't remember the epidemic, just the panic. August 1970, Sebastopol, the smell of rotten, rotting apricots, my mother's dainty tunic, which Kuiv could beach, the cotton heat, the groundswell of fear. Seething lines at the ticket office, vacationers like wartime evacuees, the talk of spreading illness, words like orifice or dehydration hanging in the breeze, the hasty packing, my collection of stag beetles forgotten on the windowsill, our train arriving at Kursk station, empty bottles, my parents kissing on the platform, reunion. I didn't know another party was near. My father, a doctor, would be dispatched to Crimea.
And of course, little did he know, and little did we all know, that uh, Crimea would become a dress rehearsal of uh, today's war in Ukraine. And I'll end with a poem that is not in this book. Uh, I've been working on a kind of uh, sequel collection, which I'm tentatively calling uh, a political afterlife, but I'm not entirely sure. It's still in the voice of uh, a Russian immigrant, but some of the poems have had to deal with the war Although not so much the war per se, but what I mentioned earlier, this really tantalizing experience that a lot of ex-Soviet Jewish immigrants are going through now, where some are really abdicating their Russianness and discovering their roots outside of Russia proper, in Belarus, in Bessarabia, in Ukraine, uh, the roots they really never particularly felt inclined to claim before. And this poem is about uh, some Jewish relatives in Minsk, in Belarus, uh, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll close with it. It's a little on the sad side. Uh, it was sad to write, but... Uh, um, and also, by the way, one other thing. Uh, I've been doing this new thing, which I really, really love. It's called parallel writing, where uh, I set out to write a text, uh, and I write it either in Russian or in English, and then sometime later I create it in, a, in the other language, but I don't translate. So they really are not the same, but they are in parallel tracks. Uh, so this exists the, in the Russian version, which actually has been published. Minsk Elegy. In the year 1942, my relative Misha Ludicki, a student, volunteered to fight the Germans. He deported Chechens and Crimean Tatars. Never once did he taste of battle. He only witnessed the inexplicable punishment of nations, Stalin's victory plan, so perfectly wicked. In 1945, Second Lieutenant ML returned to the funeral of Minsk. 80,000 Jews, but a handful lived. He married the daughter of a Jewish butcher from Komarovka Market and a local party activist, daughter of Rabbi Chaim Wolf of blessed memory, my great-grandfather. Thus we were related. Almost everything about it was messed up. In the early 1960s, Misha heard the sermons of the dissident General G. He planned to join the Union for the struggle to restore Lenin's decree, repeated the general's maxim that only rats belonged in the underfloor. The authorities had a chat with Misha. He lay low, fearing arrest, worked in a construction trust, smoked Bulgarian cigarettes. Every now and then, he would come to Moscow on a shopping spree. Once, I visited Misha and the family in Minsk, the year of the Olympic boycott. They lived in a cluttered apartment on Avenue Smitrog Bedula, named after the Belarusian Nightingale, a Jew from around Vilna. It was then I felt for the first time how history flows backward, and I realized that life can get around in broken stilts of the past. It can barely move, yet keeps at it. And all the while, my relative wouldn't leave me alone. He ambushed me in the living room beside a gramophone and played a pre-war record of a squeaky Yiddish song. Son, tell me, does this grab your soul? And all I could think of, you're such an asshole. And I nodded and trembled with genuine boredom. Misha sat at the head of the table and drank brandy from a tea glass, spoke about the gang of party thieves and drunks that robbed us of everything, served the spiciest cholent and the sweetest simis. Eat some more, son. Tell us about yourself. Share your news. Who do you have besides us? We're all that's left of the Vishpocha. And that's what I remember about the Minsk vacation. In the year 1991, they moved to Israel. Oh, merciless thief. I could never find them. The finest of repatriates, rivers. So many years have passed, it seems like it never happened. Only a long drive back, the tallow end of summer in Belarus. Only buckets full of purple plums left on the roadside. Scabs of memory on the body of the murdered Stedlach. Thank you. The rest of the book is much funnier. <laughs>